ko school kakra school ma kwa mo ho ade na mi jale mo se adwuma na mo ko se i wasn't doing well at school and so i dropped out and decided to learn some apprenticeship but hunger was killing me Charlotte is a teenage mother in the Abra Sebu Kwamankase district. She tells a chilling tale of what put her in the situation she finds herself. And then I got a guy who told me he would help me. I gave myself to him and he got me pregnant. But I decided to terminate the pregnancy and thus went to buy a 70 Ghana CD drug to terminate it. I tried and tried, but I couldn't terminate the pregnancy. So I had no option than to give birth and the Preg Foundation came to my aid. The struggle for survival. Her colleague, teenage mother, Jennifer, shares her ordeal and why she desperately needs some skills to become independent. We are many here, and so we need your support. We are many. Some are 12 years, up to 20 years. We all got pregnant, but we had no support. It isn't that we are bad girls. That is why we got pregnant. But what we would eat on a daily basis makes us give ourselves to men. Now we need your support as we have begun learning skills. Some have no parents, and their families don't even mind them. And so survival becomes our only option. And then men take advantage of us and get us pregnant. We need your help. On the street of Abra Dunkau, I meet a 40-year-old girl who is just giving birth to her second child. The tales of these girls are endless. They need to eat and be taken care of. It's a matter of survival. Their parents don't have what it takes to take care of them, they say. And these girls desperately need to survive. In the Abra Sebu Kwamankase district, the statistics of not only teenage mothers, but child mothers are disturbing and staggering. It's gradually becoming common for children between the ages of 11 and 13 becoming mothers. Children account of a single night stand of 17-year-old junior high school, one student that made her to drop out of school. He wasn't even my boyfriend. He forced me. And that was my first time too. So we tried our best, but she did not accept it. So by now, I'm staying in my father's house, and he's taking good care of me. Everything that I need, he give it to me. So by now, God willing, next month, maybe either I can deliver or not by, by the grace of God. Ever since she became pregnant eight months ago, her father has been on the heels on the man to own up the pregnancy and take full responsibility, but he wouldn't budge. Four months pregnant before I was in the school, but when I got five months pregnant, then I left the school. So I came back and I sit, I sit at home now. It's eight months now. I left school. So... The boy, the boy that I had him get pregnant, he told me that he's not the one. So finally, my father accepted, and he's helping me to buy everything that I will need for the hospital and the baby's things and anything, everything that we need for the pregnancy now. Another is a 17-year-old who dropped out of school at junior high school too. The first time I was in a form two and I got the pregnant. So my parents they didn't have money to take care of me and I got pregnant with one man. So I didn't go to school again. The duo is part of hundred girls from Isa 
fian bure engo who, who drop out of school with support from life again and non governmental organization they are ready to be back at school though with more responsibilities the upper west region's directorate of the ghana education service pegged the number of girls who returned to school pregnant at nearly 700 juxtaposing figures from the ghana health service chief executive officer of life again Saudo to Mohammed kept the numbers in the region higher than the one reported by the Ghana Education Service. Last year, COVID hit us and we saw that a lot of girls became pregnant. Um, according to statistics, we have about 110,000 girls between the ages of 10 to 19 years who became pregnant. And most of these girls dropped out of school. In the Upper West region here, we have close to 4,000 girls. And for me, I believe this is even, this is even uh, a, um, um, a reduced figure because these are figures or these are girls who have visited the facilities, health facilities, and they got recorded by the Ghana Health Service. There are lots of girls in the rural areas who are pregnant or who have given birth within this period, but were, were not visiting the, uh, uh, um, the centers, so they were not recorded. Her outfit launched a campaign in March this year to support teen mothers with skills training to enable them to generate income to take care of themselves and those who wish to go back to school. 100 teen mothers benefited from the program, 20 of whom are being supported to go back to school. We are all about ensuring that these girls are empowered. And also, we have a number of girls who say they want to go back to school even after giving birth. And we, have, we are giving them scholarship, comprehensive scholarship to get back to school. And we have items, we're going to give them school materials to help them to get back to school and stay in school. So it's not a one-time support. Right, so what you are hearing it's not some fiction, it's real. And the report breaks my heart. Uh, we are starting this discussion with the woman who is in charge of the Dofsu. So, yesterday, you gave me a call. I had given you a call on Thursday when I had a very bad story and was looking for help that you could take charge of it so that there would be some prosecution. And then I got a return call from you. Show our viewers and listeners how these are not isolated issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Samson. Um, issues of teenage pregnancy, and obviously when it's below 16 years, it's defilement, is um, something that we see almost all the time. It is real. It's not something, uh, it's not a data somebody cooked up from somewhere and decided to put it in the public domain. Almost every day in our premises across the country, we have cases of domestic violence, specifically defilement, since we are talking about defilement, defilement where it results in pregnancy. And for instance, the one I spoke to you about mm. involved, unfortunately, in this situation, a father who impregnated a daughter and as a result have had two abortions for the 15 the lady. Um, 14, the first abortion was when she was 14 years and the second abortion was when she was 16 years. And these are not cases that are, uh, it's not an isolated case. I remember about 10 years ago, I handled a case where the child was 13 years and she was pregnant and she was defiled and the court had to give an order, give order for an, uh, abortion. And even that, even if she has a right, which she does under the law, to have an abortion because she's been defiled, Looking at the size of the child, going through that kind of um, uh, procedure, uh, it's something that uh, you, we can't imagine because this is somebody whose body is still yet to be fully developed. To, to get pregnant is an issue and to further go further to have an abortion 
is, is not something that um, it's good for the health of their child. So every day we have this, and our statistics show. Mm. In fact, if you look at our statistics, we have, for instance, in uh, 2016 to 2020, we have 719 for 2016, 790 for um, 719 yeah. for 2016. So those of you who are watching, look at uh, the Sub figures. Yes, yeah, 719 for 2016, 790 for 2017, 2018, 637. Of course, there was a decrease if you look at the statistics. Mm. And then in 2019, it's just shot up to 1,285. And then in 2020, it came down to um, 1047. Now, these are the reported cases. So, if you look at the cases on pregnant, uh, teenage pregnant, um, uh, teenage pregnancy, when you look at the data, you realize that I think uh, between, for the last five years, um, there was about between 10 to 14, because deformment is below 16 years. So, between 10 and 14 years, if you look at the statistics from the Ghana Health Service, it's 13,444 you know, for the last five years. So um, if you put our data together, it, it shows that um, a lot more people are not reporting. If mm. you look at what it means that people, but you see, under the domestic violence um, law. Be, be, before that, you see something that is happening. The, the statistics that you have mm -hmm. from your department shows that in 2020, please put it back, in 2020, it came down from 1,285 to 1,047. Now, from the Ghana Health Service statistics about the girls who got pregnant mm -hmm. and who are under 14. Exactly. That's almost 3,000. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then if you take the number who are between 15 to 19, mm -hmm. then you have 100,000 plus. Mm -hmm. So it means there is such a gulf of mm -hmm. a gap. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a gap. In fact, um, what I have, like, if you look at the, um, I hope uh, we have the same. So, so there are, there are those who have reported to the hospital just so they are taken care of because they got pregnant. Yes, because they got pregnant. And then those you have dealt with are those who have reported to police, to police. for purposes of prosecution. Exactly. Okay. And then, so when you look at the data here, you realize that a lot more people are not reporting. But then those who report under the law, the health uh, provider is mandated by the law to report. So any time uh, a, a victim of defilement or sexual assault walks to the health serv service provider, he or she, whoever attends to her, must report to the police. Mm. So if the health providers were reporting to us, then it will, show, it will get a true reflection of the actual statistics on the ground, at least for those who report to the providers. So we encourage our various health providers. I mean, if you look at section six, filing of com under the Domestic Violence Act, section six, mm -hmm. filing of complaints with police, uh, we have different people who can pro um, report to the police when they suspect any form of domestic violence and all that. Mm -hmm. And so um, health providers are mandated under the law to report to the police on um, any case of um, domestic violence. And sexual assault, assault, obviously, is under the domestic violence. So we encourage service providers, doctors, nurses, um, health facilities that these children visit, they should kindly report to us. It's just a matter of just getting the contact person of either the DOFSU officer there or the district officer or the d divisional commander or the chief inspector at the district and calling the person. You don't need to move. You don't need to go to the police station. Yeah. Just call the person and say, you know what? We have this case that has been reported. A child 14 years is pregnant. She, she is at our facility. Then we will come there and then start the process with you. So people don't have to worry that they have to go to the police to do that report. Let me get to Lamatu.
once again, thank you very much for being with us. From where you are and where you work, how is this situation? I, I know that in, in your part of the country, you focus a lot more on early marriages, girls who are being forced to marry um, under the age that they cannot even consent to sex. But how is the situation where you are? And what do you have to say about uh, what has been uh, revealed? Thank you, Samson. And um, like the Dovsu National um, Coordinator has said, the figures we are seeing um, and we think it's alarming, it's, it's on the low. Uh, also because of factors that a lot of them are not being reported. And you and I can understand that in most of our remote communities where there's an uh, issue of accessing even police station uh, is, is, is a key one uh, that we cannot ignore. Uh, not to talk about whether the family of a girl who has been raped or has been pregnant have the capacity to travel from, from a remote community just to make a complaint at a police station is, is, is another. Um, it is not new to us and it is frightening for me. I think that we, we have a much bigger pandemic that is looming you know, to us. Um, if we have as young as 10 years girls who are getting pregnant, uh, what does that tell us? That a child is giving birth to a child and who then takes the responsibility of taking care of the two children. Okay. Um, here in, in, in the northern part, a lot of factors we can say can contribute to this. Um, one is the issue of false uh, betrothed or early marriages. Um, which it, it, it's a key thing that bothers us it, because it's quite deep-seated. It's a traditional and cultural issue that for, for some families to get married, they have to exchange a girl in their family in order to be married. And that tells you that whether the child has just been given birth earlier or just nine or five years, the child already is betrothed. And once a child is betrothed to a, a man, um, it then tells the man that, look, this is your wife, but just that she's still a child. And so there's a cultural issue that we have to look at. Beyond that, if you see clearly in the video, hunger, even getting part can you know, push a girl to, 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 to get a man to waste her, as we have seen. Uh, we have done a lot of survey and uh, looking at what are the deeper issues that we need to look at. And hunger has come up. A lot of girls will attend, to, uh, will attend school, but then they, they are not even given one signal to go and fend for themselves. And so a guy can just quickly lure them. A guy who can be giving her one CD, she thinks that it is such a person that she must, um, you know, give in return, whatever it is. And then also, uh, for us who are particular about a uh, child marriage issue, clearly pregnancies are a conduit for child marriage. Also because of you know, some of the families who think that it is a shame for a girl not to be pregnant and not to be married but and, and, and gotten pregnant. And so for a girl who is pregnant, it serves as a conduit for the person to be married. And so um, we might not necessarily be looking at this figure. There are more to it that we can see. But for me, I want to say that we can we can blame you know some of the issues to the lack of you know um, sectoral collaboration as we've heard because if if we put it in such a way that if there's a mechanism that will let the coordination between Ghana Health Service, DOFSU, social welfare, and even SHRAD such that in a case that is reported, whether the person is married or not, once it is below 18 years we clearly know that it's a right violation. And then we quickly make an attempt for such a person to be arrested. Mm. Then there'll be motivation 
you know, for people to stop child marriage and stop this abuse of girls. But if we don't see it, and it's, it's always a rhetoric that um, uh, cases are not coming, how are the cases going to come? I'll give you an example, Samson. In, in West Mampugo, for example, a man has impregnated a woman and has defiled three of her, her, the woman's children. You know, for me, I think that such a case should not be getting the 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 the, the, the police or the court uh, adjourning here and there, because there are multiple counts apart from defilement. There are rape cases involving that. Why should we give bail to such a person? I know that I'm a human rights activist, and the person could have right to a bill. But then, when there are multiple of such, it's very annoying that. People will look at such a man who has committed several of these working free because eventually the other systemic issues that I've talked about is going to deny the girl and the woman to be able to, you know, further the case at the court. Because one of the, uh, the adjournment cases when we witnessed was that the woman was afraid to appear in court. She will be because as this thing has happened to her, nobody, no counseling, nothing for a woman to be pregnanted by a man, and the same man, you know, violating the rights of three other children. And yet, no proper counseling has been given to such a woman and, and girl. Do you think she has the confidence to appear in court? And so eventually, what's going to happen to that, that case? We're going to have it free. And uh, as much as we are making follow-up to this, we want to say that, look, until we put a very important step to see the issues of sexual and gender-based violence as a priority, we're going to always come back here and ask ourselves, what's the way forward? Intersectorial collaboration is darkening the gender violence in our country. Okay, so, I mean, sincerely, I don't know what I want to say. Um, I'd like to say that this program is brought to you by the kind uh, sponsorship of Bank of Africa, as strong as a group, close as a partner, MTN everywhere you go, Ashesi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa, Robert and Sons, seeing is believing, way lead, whom is swear one start. Star Assurance, your solid partner, Duraplus, where Duraplus goes, water flows, DBS Industries, MG Auto Trading, official distributors of MG vehicles in Ghana, and CBG, we stand with you. My guest on this special edition of News File, you just heard Lamnatu Adam, who is executive director, Sungtaba, an NGO based in the northern region. And earlier, you heard Chief Superintendent Ousua Treme, director of DOFSU. Uh, my other guests are Dr. Ako Akotoampao, who is Medical Director, Eastern Regional Hospital. Professor Kujo Apiejechua is at the School of Law, University of Ghana. And Professor Akosia K. Dakwa, a sociologist, University of Ghana. So, uh, Professor Dakwa, I'm coming to you now on how, how, how you take these statistics, what do they mean to you? How do you, how do you interpret them? What do you think we should do with them? Okay, so I'd like to pick up from where Ousia mm. ended. She made the point that they don't actually scratch the surface in terms of what they get. Mm. Because even in terms of the people who are showing up at the hospital, not all of them are reporting at the Dovsu Center. So That's the right. health services are not collaborating with the police services, a point that Lamnatu made very strongly. But what we are missing is all of those outside of that. So we look at the numbers and we say 500,000 girls over the last five years. But if we think about those who didn't report, those numbers are really just scratching the surface. I also want to point out that when we think in terms of the numbers, it's important to keep the bodies behind those numbers in view. When we say 500,000, we mean half a million girls mm -hmm. across this country. We mean now you're calling somebody's house. We mean Akosia in somebody's house. We mean Fafali in another person's house. We mean Amina in... These are not just numbers. There are whole bodies behind those numbers. 
They are living in families. They go about their daily business. This is not just about the girls. It's about all of us. If a child gives birth to a child, she cannot raise that child right. She cannot raise herself right. All of us are the worst off for it. Because with each child, if they grow to their full potential, they benefit not just themselves, but the society as a whole. That 14-year-old who is pregnant could have grown up to become the nano engineer of the future. All of us will benefit from it. But now, she's trapped as a teen mother, unable to fulfill her full potential. And we need to begin to pay attention to that mm. and ask ourselves, how did we produce an environment where such a thing happens with impunity? People are getting away with murder and turning young women's lives into nothingness, basically. I mean, if you are 14 and you have a child, what are you supposed to do with that? These are people who are supposed to be in Form 3, getting on with their classes, getting on with big dreams of their own. And here we are saddling them. And a lot of what we hear in the media makes it seem as if it's the girls and their faults. But no, it's an indictment on we, the adults, mm. and we produce an environment where this happens to the young women. To be frank with you, on our social media page, on my page, mm -hmm. some of these comments have come yeah. where some are blaming the girls. And what I do is I just delete those. Mm -hmm. I delete, if you come back the next time with such a comment, I block you. Yeah. Why will our society want to blame the girl who is a minor, who needs guidance, and may have been taken advantage of or exploited by an adult who is supposed to provide care for her? So the first thing we need to remember is that you are much more likely to actually be abused by somebody close to you. The likelihood that a complete stranger abused these girls is not impossible, but it's rare. Mm. The most likely people to be worried about are the people close to the girl. Older male cousins, we take this for granted. Mm. You are leaving home, you leave your 12-year-old routinely with her 15-year-old older cousin, right? That's something we need to be paying attention to. Those who have drivers who are dropping children back and forth, that's something to be watching. The gardener, the quote-unquote houseboy, mm. right? The boy in the neighborhood that the child knows. The teachers in their schools. That's where the problem is. And because we are unwilling to confront that reality, we are unwilling to start taking on our neighbors, our family members, and addressing the issues that produce the teenage pregnancy. We blame it on the young women. That's the easiest thing to do. Mm. But Part of what we need to begin to do is have an honest conversation with ourselves as the adults in this country and ask ourselves, how is it that we've gotten to this point where family honor is far more important than the girl's life and her ability to lead her life to the fullest. So the first thing a parent or a family member is thinking is, if we go to the police, everybody will know. So let's not go to the police, right? If we go to the courts, it will take a long time. The family will give us 900 cities. 900 cities sounds like a lot of money. So you sacrifice the girl for the 900 cities, right? We need to begin to put the girls at the center of this. We are in an environment where children are not, yes, we talk about, uh, this is a pronatalist environment. Mm -hmm. Children are a blessing. But if a child is a blessing to you, it's a responsibility also, and we need to take it fully on as a responsibility and recognize that the children should be at the center of the discussions and not the adults. We don't do that often enough. Mm. And I think just to add to what Bob said, I think uh, children are also blamed because of our history, background, how human rights started. I mean, before then, we, uh, children were not subjects of human rights. They were seen more of objects of human rights. And as a result, a child was more not to be heard, but to be seen. And a child couldn't talk or ask questions about sex. Mm. Because growing up, should you talk about sex, I mean, you'll be ripped and, and, and not even given food to eat. And so we have come far, we've carried this, even though Ghana, we've come far in terms of the rights for children and all that, people still believe in the fact that 
if there is sex, it should have been the child who went there. I mean, what did you go there to do? For instance, I remember in a, in a, in a, a certain situation where a child was defiled, and the first question that came from the mouth of the adult person was, what did you go there to do? Does it really matter what the person went there to do? Mm. You know, the law is very clear, especially for children under 16 years. It just doesn't matter. Even if she said, have sex with me, it just doesn't matter. Because at that age, consent is void. Yeah. The child cannot give consent when she's below 16 years. So the issue of what did you go to do? Why must you do? Why did you go there? Why did you even wear this short skirt? Is, is a non-starter. And so we need to, we can move forward if we change our mindsets. If we want to be transformed as a nation, so we, we need to transform we will how come, we think. We will come to the solutions and the bottlenecks, you know, the impediments, there are a lot of that. And people have sent a lot of messages which are questions. And some are telling me real situations and they are asking what sort of help they can get. Um, Professor uh, PJ, it, uh, what, what, the question I ask uh, Professor Akusia Dakwa, what, what do you make of the statistics? How do you interpret them? What should we do with them as a nation? Well, the statistics are quite shocking and it tells a story of the fact that um, we are, the adults should look ourselves in the faces and accept a big blame for this. The same we're talking about um, the politics in the West African context where it was to be blamed. I think that it calls for interpreting the statistics as failure on the part of the adult population and also the institutions and systems and mechanisms we've put in place. If we just look at making laws, we would have made huge progress in seeking to address this problems. But law alone does not solve the problem. And so um, Akosia is there, she will talk about the fact that you have to contextualize the discussion. We have laws on trocracy, we have laws on widowhood rights and so on, but they have not been contextualized in the context of where the cultural understandings of that issue is coming from. And so we need to look at it from two angles. The, what, um, the, the gender angle, as well as from the theory of rights angle. The society has been constructed in such a way that women or even girls in this context are always to be blamed. And so the burden is that the woman is structured or constructed in a certain way. And so at the end of the day, she is seen as a victim. When you look at the cultural underpinnings of discrimination against women, there are sometimes situations where people could not find solutions to some problems which may have a scientific basis for it. And women are blamed for it. Hmm. And because women is seen uh, as the, the, the uh, responsible, they are not involved in the decision making or to find a solution to the problem. And if you are deemed as the culprit, certainly the laws or the processes that we put in place will work against you. At the same time, we also need to see how the man or the male has been constructed. The male has been constructed as aggressive, as somebody who is supposed to be the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. And it shows in the way these little girls have been defiled and impregnated. Because the man sees himself as the breadwinner, gives the lady a little girl one CD. And he seems to have fulfilled a responsibility, and there has to be that um, a, a favor returned. And the man is seen as the aggressor, and therefore, if he rapes the girl, is seen as normal. And so we need to make sure that we interpret the situations that these girls find themselves in from the angle where they are. They, they are the victims and they need to be, we need to reconfigure and reinterpret the whole gender relations in such a way that we are able to understand where the problem is coming from. And then um, Madame Dovsu also talks about um, the fact that children are not seen 
or are not heard, they are only seen, and so on. And, and the fact that we need to look at the issue from the rights angle, yes. For children, they, for a long time, the argument has been that children don't have rights. But the fact that we have a child rights convention, the fact that Ghana now has um, an act to protect children's rights, the fact that we have a juvenile uh, justice act, the fact that even the courts have set up um, some circuit courts identified as child-friendly, gender-related uh, uh, court systems. It, it indicates that we are no more living in the uh, past ages, but we are in an era and time where rights should be seen as interest-based for children. So that there are some rights which are fundamental, or some interests which are so fundamental to them that it should place a duty on multiple stakeholders, the family or the, or the parents, the community, the uh, district assemblies, the police, uh, and many other actors, that they have these responsibilities they owe to the children, the school as well. And then on the other hand, children should also, the rights should be seen as a, in the context of a will theory, that the children have some will, some concerns, that they should be able to allow to articulate, and which should be represent, presented in such a way that society should sit back and listen and take into account their concerns to be able to um, find solutions or answers to them. And I think if we approach the issue from this angle, it will help us to properly interpret the data that is a failure, mm -hmm. institutional failure, failure on the part of the family, failure on the part of the community. And we really need to sit up and do something. Um, it, it is interesting that there is a huge responsibility, even on the health authorities, that if there is a case of defilement reported to you, you, it, it, well, the, the person will just come for medical attention. But the law says report the matter. The Whistleblowers Act talks about situations where these issues can also be brought to the fore. So my conclusion is that the law is not working or we are not allowing the law to work and sometimes the law is not working because of lack of acceptance of responsibility shaking of responsibility of the stakeholders involved and also it's not working because the cultural circumstances have not been properly um, um, understood and made us to, to be part of the whole mechanism of um, identifying the needs that the children should be placed at the at the, at the top as critical in the needs of the children. Mm. Um, on the question of the law is not working, I'll return to you on that uh, because uh, I have questions that have been sent in by an aspect of the law that we all may need to pay attention to. Um, questions of, you know, victims or survivors of domestic violence who need some medical attention and what the law says that they should get it for free and yet they have to pay. Um, let me bring in uh, Dr. Akutawampao. Now, I, I know that, you know, there's a reason you joined the Coalition for Survivors of Domestic Violence because they identified you apart from the fact that this is the job you do, you, you, you do your practice, and you are also the regional chair of the Ghana Medical Association. The group identified you as one doctor who attends to abused persons in a way that the law requires. So you don't ask for money and all of these things. Now, the people that you attend to who are abused, I want you to look at that against the statistics that we are uh, discussing now. What does it tell you? Thank you very much, um, Samson. Um, if I look at the numbers I see, as against the numbers that have been put on the show, it's just a drop in the ocean. These numbers put here are very staggering. They are shocking, 
they are unfortunate and they are very unacceptable. Even for me, coming from the health perspective, having reviewed some of this data with respect to the things that it was collected from, and if I aggregate them as it is now, it is really shocking. And if you take the girls under um, 15 who are even abused, a whooping 13,000 plus. But something, if everything put together, whatever it is, whatever reasons it is that we keep, that we say, okay, it's child marriage, rape, broken home, these numbers are still very high. But I would want us as like health workers to look beyond just the numbers and then have an understanding into what it is that is happening. Um, the, when I looked at the numbers, really over the five years we are discussing, from 2016 to 2020, there has not been any change. There has not been any significance in the increase or significance in the decrease. If somebody said that they have decreased, then it was just by chance. Yeah. Because you need to calculate this based on the total number of pregnancies, then you can understand what really is happening. Or you posit it against the total population of the region in discussion, or even look at the women who are probably in reproductive age, of which you can see what it is. But something more importantly for us, we need to disaggregate the numbers. When we do that, even within the regions and districts, then we can see that in specific areas, the problem is more pervasive than we even think. If I look at the under 15, which is even more problematic for me, 13,000 plus in five years of women under 15 have gotten pregnant. And as um, the doctor would say, this is statutory rape. And based on that, what has happened to these numbers? Would all agree that it's just a fraction of that which we are seeing? We are actually seeing the, the tip of the pyramid. So what happened to those who did not even report to the hospital for us to report on? Those that have reported to the hospital, what happened to a percentage of them who did not even go to their dorsal? But those who appeared at dorsal, how many of them were prosecuted? And those who had prosecution, how many of them were sentenced or jailed? And so we get to put these numbers together to increase it from what it is at the tip of the pyramid right down to the bottom to probably get a square. We really would not be doing justice to this shocking and unacceptable situation of child pregnancies. Now, now, those that you see, in terms of examining them, um, Oswa just told us that you have a duty to report to the police if they themselves have not done so. Does this come to you? Absolutely, Samson. We have a duty of care beyond just what the physical things that we see and treat. And for any health worker, the comprehensive care of the patient is what is very uh, paramount. And what happens with the reporting to the police? It's unfortunate sometimes when you even make a report to the police, no action is immediately taken because culturally we have accepted some of those things. Uh -huh. But should it be that it's um, an issue of an allegation of rape, that one they tend to even uh, begin to work around it. But if a mother has come with a child to the hospital and said the child is pregnant, just on the surface pregnant, how are you going to report that matter to the police? I didn't give 
an exact call of a report from hospital to the police, though it is um, not directly related to this. So this week passed, we saw somebody at the hospital who could not pay fees. So from the social workers, it came to my attention that we need to waive the fees of the person. So in reading what it is that they are put together, apparently this person alleged that he tried, he was a Nigerian who had been camped by another Nigerian in Ghana, mm -hmm. and they tried to escape from the person. Mm -hmm. So in escaping, they had to scale a wall, and then in jumping, he broke the ankle and was brought to the hospital, and we are treated. He didn't have any money to pay. But listening to the story, it did not add up. So we reported to the police and said, we think this person should be investigated, probably has some criminal things around it. Something, can you believe that it didn't go anywhere? They referred us to um, another bureau of the police. And they say that he's an adult enough. If that is true, he should report that there's some kidnapping. And it really, I, I did not understand why it had to be so. So driving the point home, sometimes it is the action that is taken following the report that makes it imperative that some health workers will not consider to pursue the agenda. Of course, obviously for me, I was going to write to the police again, maybe to a higher authority to look into that particular case. You are still here on News File. A News File is brought to you by the kind of sponsorship of Bank of Africa, strong as a group and close as a partner. MTN everywhere you go. Ashesi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Robert and Son, seeing is believing. Way lead, home is where one starts. Star Assurance, your solid partner. Duraplus, where Duraplus goes, water flows. DBS Industries and MG Auto Trading, official distributors of MG vehicles in Ghana. CBG, we stand with you. Um, we will take a break here, and when we return, I have your questions, your contributions. Uh, some doctors too have been sending us messages about uh, what they have attended to and some solutions that they require. So we will try and examine the issues even a lot deeper and discuss the solutions. Do they exist? In the absence of the law uh, or in addition to the law, what else is done to uh, survivors of these uh, circumstances? We'll be right back. <laughs> 